could be coming from the federal government to kill them. The question was, where is the federal housing money that's been promised? And there's actually two, two uh, separate chunks of money that's been promised and, and, and not actually uh, been delivered. There was the 2001 uh, housing allocation, the affordable housing framework agreement uh, money, uh, of which um, there's still uh, several hundred million dollars, uh, probably close to half a billion dollars that has not yet been accounted for uh, federally. So there's that chunk of money from before, and much of that is due to the City of Toronto and to uh, the province of Ontario. And then more recently, in June of 2005, uh, Parliament authorized $1.6 billion for affordable housing. Uh, the good news on that is about two or three weeks ago, uh, the federal government, when it uh, declared its uh, surplus, uh, it, uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, it uh, authorized 1.4 of the $1.6 billion uh, to be put into trust funds, uh, $300 million for the territories, $300 million for off-reserve Aboriginal housing, and $800 million for the provinces. Uh, Toronto's share of that is about $120 million. The federal government uh, says that the, all Toronto needs to do to access that money is to come up with a plan, and we're happy to give uh, yep. the blueprint that then homelessness as being a very practical plan. Now those that have read the paper in the last couple of days will know that uh, inevitably um, there are uh, squabbles between uh, senior levels of government and um, there's some concern that the squabbles may be causing some slowdown in the money that's happened before and that's why I think it's important those of us that are concerned about housing uh, push forward on, um, uh, on uh, these issues and insist that the money that's been authorized by Parliament be released and uh, put into community. Can we be more effective as social workers and advocate for better housing and stuff like that? being students and stuff and everything. The, the question, uh, the social work students asking how to be um, uh, better advocates, and I think that uh, one thing that's uh, very important is that anyone that's involved in professional relationship with people who are poor, who are homeless, uh, who are uh, in these kinds of situations knows that you can do a lot of work on a one-on-one -on -one basis, uh, and that's very important work, casework, uh, but it's also important to lift it out of the uh, category of the one-on-one -on -one and to, uh, to advocate for systemic uh, changes uh, in our report. We uh, uh, we mainly uh, are the report is focused on housing. We're mainly talking about the brick and mortar issues and the affordability issues. Uh, one thing I would suggest is that uh, uh, as students, that you can be engaged in uh, a number of community organizations uh, that are uh, involved in uh, these issues. Uh, I know that there's I see John Campy from the Community Social Planning Council of Toronto, and uh, they uh, do a lot of work um, uh, and. Uh, we're very uh, happy to work with them as well on a number of issues uh, along those lines. I think getting engaged with these... particular uh, message you want me to send? Well, I think the, the, the two messages, uh, and I know that uh, here in the audience, uh, I saw Dry, uh, is he still here, Dry? Maybe we're not, Dry sometimes goes out for smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not advocating smoking. Um, uh, and uh, Tanya Gulliver, uh, they were there this morning at the, the committee, and I, I was last week in Ottawa at the, appearing at the committee. I think the, the, uh, the two messages are that uh, the money that's been authorized and allocated, that that money needs, uh, uh, need, we need to move that ahead uh, very, very quickly, and it represents an important down payment. Just to give you an idea, we could fund the entire first year of uh, the Blueprint uh, program uh, just simply by taking the money that uh, has been uh, uh, allocated but not yet um, uh, put into the hands of the City of Toronto, so it's important. The second message is that there's a very important federal homelessness program called the Supporting Community Partnerships Initiative, which is due to sunset at the end of this year, uh, the fiscal year, and uh, that will mean uh, that many services, including some people in this room, uh, uh, will uh, have to stop services for homeless and poor people and they will have to uh, uh, lay off staff and it's very important the federal government get the message that that's a, that's a, a very needed program. The framework is, is quite timely. We're uh, just a little bit uh, more than two weeks away from a municipal election and I found one of the graphics you had up there not only the need for affordable housing but how many wards no housing has been built in the last decade. So I think uh, an interesting question to ask uh, a lot of councillors and perhaps a lot of would-be councillors, what are they prepared to do or what have they done to produce a lot more affordable housing <coughs> in the city? So that's Harvey Cooper for the Co-op Housing Federation of Canada. And, and, and uh, obviously one of the reasons things we wanted to do by putting out the ward by ward was to give practical information and through our partners in spacing, and I think Sean 
uh, set up this arrangement. Uh, uh, this information is going to be put in the hands of all of the uh, candidates, uh, uh, incumbents and challengers, uh, and uh, they'll be looking for responses back and we'll be able to uh, give people some practical information to help them in a few weeks when they go to the polls to know on this critical issue where politicians are standing. Their plan is not working. I don't know why we always have to follow New York. We should stand on our own two feet come up with our own answers. Thanks. Uh, that's Bonnie Briggs, a uh, long time uh, a friend and colleague. Uh, and Bonnie was pointing out that New York City, which we uh, took the idea from a community organization called the Supporting Housing, Supportive Housing Network of New York for their uh, blueprint. Uh, and she pointed out that, in fact, uh, uh, New York, uh, there are still over 30,000 people every night uh, staying in homeless shelters. New York uh, has certainly not been able to solve the problem uh, of uh, homelessness, uh, but we think the blueprint that they developed was still a good one, and if only the politicians would, would follow it, uh, then uh, it probably wouldn't be as bad as uh, the conditions you witnessed when you were down there a couple of weeks ago. Are you anticipating that all of the housing you pulled for, given the funding you've moved ahead, will be built by public because you know those of us who've been working on water plants have gone to great lengths to make sure that the standards on water plants are way higher than the official plans. And the problem is, even the standards, the official plans are being appealed by the development industry. So do you see the only possibility in being the public agency building this housing, or do you think there's any way the development industry can somehow be legislated or persuaded or however dragged on site to give a percentage of their site to the building industry? Julie Beto, that's Julie Beto. She's very active on waterfront uh, issues and housing issues in particular, and the question was, of course, around uh, some of the particular mechanisms. Um, this report doesn't go into a lot of detail about mechanisms um, uh, in, in particular. Obviously, there needs to be long-term affordability uh, guarantees uh, for anyone that, uh, uh, any developer that accepts the money, and of course the best guarantee uh, that uh, a project that gets funding will remain affordable over time is that it remains uh, as a co-op or a non-profit uh, housing project. In the history of Toronto, uh, the Spruce Court um, project I mentioned, built in 1913 and converted back in Harvey was the 1980s that it was converted to a co-op? Mid-70s. 75, there you go. See, Harvey knows almost everything about co-ops. Also about Tim Hortons, too, but that's another <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, uh, so so uh, it, it, is, it is critical, and uh, we, we think in terms of, um, uh, you know, we said the 25% set aside for Aboriginal housing. As you know, there are non-profit Aboriginal housing providers. Those of you that have been reading the papers in the last couple of days will have seen Frances Sanderson, uh, 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 who's uh, been uh, quoted extensively, and she worked with us to develop the notion of the Aboriginal set aside for nonprofit Aboriginal housing under Aboriginal control. So I think that's a that's a key component. What we think, though, is that money can actually help kickstart a sector that was uh, really gutted back in the 90s when the senior levels of government withdrew. So we've now got some money coming back in. We can kickstart uh, and, and build back up the development capacity of the not-for-profit sector. And that's uh, Sue Ann Levy and asking the money question. <laughs> so um, so the, 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 um, this project was funded entirely by the Wellesley uh, Institute, which is a not-for-profit uh, uh, community-based uh, foundation uh, based uh, here in uh, Toronto. Um, I don't have an exact uh, number in terms of uh, the uh, expenses that we put into it, but um, uh, I could uh, ballpark it by uh, saying that uh, we probably... Uh, spent fifty, sixty thousand uh, um, dollars uh, not including uh, the staff costs and, uh, uh, and so on in terms of research, in terms of uh, uh, some of the production and uh, that type of thing. On your question of, um, of uh, new supply, uh, on page eight of the, uh, the blueprint uh, there is um, a, uh, a chart which sets out the target in each of the uh, key categories. Uh, the capital or operating dollars, uh, and then uh, it also uh, breaks down uh, uh, where that money would uh, come from. The total amount uh, for all of the uh, both supply and affordability measures uh, on an annual basis is 585 in capital and 252 in operating 
of which is, as you can see, there's already a significant amount committed in existing budget lines, uh, so it's a simply a question of uh, more efficiently using existing budget lines. Um, just over how many <laughs> that was the question. I read this, Th this is an annual basis. So this... So this, this for 10 years. We think 10 years, uh, this is based on a 10-year uh, program at that point, obviously, or, or before then, uh, there would be, uh, uh, it would be important to uh, assess, um, look at um, how much has actually been developed. Is it uh, achieving uh, the goal of um, uh, housing the people uh, that uh, need the housing the most? Earlier on, Bonnie mentioned New York City, and New York City has, in fact, developed tens of thousands of new homes in the since uh, uh, 2002, but uh, many of those homes are out of reach of the people that need them the most, and that's part of. So, so Sue Ann, the the um, there would need to be an, an ongoing uh, assessment of uh, what's done, and that's a role that Wellesley is uh, committed to continuing to play. We're we're not simply here to release a report and then go away. Uh, our report is not geared to November 13th, which is Municipal Election Day, but it's November 14th, the day after, to working with council to make. Uh, uh, to make this like another report, so I'm wondering how is this going to be different than other reports? Targets often don't get that. Yes, that's a, that's a, an absolutely great question. I think part of the uh, answer is uh, uh, the people that you see in this room uh, and uh, our commitment to uh, uh, simply we, we, we know that uh, good policy is important, but good policy is not enough. That if all it took was good policy to uh, to get action from government, then uh, uh, we wouldn't uh, have to worry about this because there's been plenty of good uh, policy. We know this has to be tied in with uh, uh, specific initiatives to continue to monitor and assess. We've got a, a plan rolling out uh, for each of these uh, initiatives. Uh, so for instance on the inclusive planning, which we think is an, uh, an absolutely critical component and can actually generate thousands of new affordable homes every year. It does in places like Saskatoon and Vancouver and it's actually very easy for Toronto um, uh, to simply adopt uh, measures from other communities as, as Julie has already pointed out in terms of places like the central waterfront. Um, so uh, our, our commitment is to continue as, a, as an institute to, uh, to monitor this but also to work with people. Now on our website there's also some action tips and some tools for people who, uh, who want to uh, take action. And I guess the other thing I'll, I'll say at the risk of uh, glamorizing too much the uh, internet um, uh, I'm quite excited about the fact that we have a partnership uh, with spacing.ca and with a number of uh, other blogs in Toronto and that they're harnessing a whole group of urban activists who, who uh, are uh, committed to taking this issue uh, forward. Uh, and so I think uh, you know, our commitment is, is not simply to release the report and move on to the next subject but to follow through uh, on this. And I'm also uh, really thrilled to see that there's been some costing out uh, with regards to the issue of criminalization. There's two studies that you've alluded to in, in this part of the report. One is a, one that was done in Montreal, then there's another one here that was done by the Solicitor General. I'm wondering, uh, are there any numbers that came out of, um, in terms of how much it costs when you look at the numbers of individuals that lose their housing because of their incarceration? I'm not aware of the sort of detailed numbers. Uh, that's uh, Amber Kellen from John Howard Society, um, and uh, you've got a study coming out very soon. Or is it out? Is it out? It's coming out very, it's very, coming out very soon on incarceration and homelessness, which is very, very important. You know, I think uh, th this document and even the, the, the bigger document are meant to be more umbrellas. Um, we certainly want to, I think that's an important issue to take up. You know, one of the things that's most striking uh, on any piece of research, whether you're looking at uh, incarceration, uh, whether you're looking at hospitalization, uh, or just simply institutionalizing people in shelters, is uh, that there's a huge cost attached to that. We call it the cost of doing nothing, and it's far greater to do nothing, in other words, to institutionalize or criminalize uh, or hospitalize people than it is to uh, provide them with uh, good homes uh, and um, uh, the support that they need. I live in TCHC, and I know that some of these units that are going to come online at some point will be involved with TCHC. And my experience and others has been is that many people with mental health issues and with addiction problems end up just being recycled out of the apartments and out into the street and into the shelters again because there's not the support for them within the housing. And the TCHC, the landlord, is too quick to kick them out. What can this blueprint do or a future blueprint do to prevent people from being recycled? So that was a, a question about uh, supports, which are absolutely critical for a significant part of the population who 
need more than just a good, healthy, affordable home, but they need uh, some supports to help them access and maintain uh, their homes in, in the way you described. And this report actually proposes um, uh, for the first time that there actually be new funding for supportive housing. Uh, what we've had since the housing cuts of the 1990s is a provincial commitment to supportive housing, but actually the commitment doesn't go very far. It doesn't go far enough to, for instance, provide for new brick and mortar, so there aren't actually new supportive units being built. Uh, what happens in many communities like Hamilton, Toronto, and elsewhere is that supportive housing providers go into the uh, market and they compete with uh, uh, other um, uh, low-income uh, people uh, to, uh, for the existing scarce uh, housing. So we have, um, within the umbrella here, uh, funding set aside uh, both for brick and mortar for new supportive uh, homes, uh, but also funding to provide for the kinds of supports that you're talking about. There are a lot of very successful models, again, in Toronto and elsewhere, that deal exactly with the uh, situation uh, you've been describing. Uh, working with the uh, hardest to house uh, tenants, which are labeled, I should say, hardest to house, uh, and uh, providing uh, safe, affordable housing and allowing people uh, to, um, uh, to find their feet and to gain uh, some measure of independence with the proper kinds of supports. <coughs> Here in Toronto, we had some wonderful examples, uh, including the Rupert Pilot Project of the early 1990s, uh, which was such a great project. The government gave everyone involved. I was the coordinator of that project, we all got certificates from the government and a big a dinner in honor, and then they closed the project down. So that was quite wonderful. The volume of newcomers in Toronto now and the volume that continue to come to Toronto and the interesting challenges that that uh, creates. So in terms of the homelessness, what sort of issues are you seeing and to what extent has the report uh, uh, sort of been causes and of that? Very important question about newcomers and, and uh, most of the population increase uh, over the next 25 years, uh, our figures on population increase are drawn from the latest projections from the Ontario Ministry of Finance, which uh, every now and then uh, um, uh, extrapolates out over 25 years, projects out. They're saying that almost all of the population increase in Toronto and most of Ontario will come from uh, immigration as opposed to natural birth. And uh, that has some interesting implications. I do want to uh, point to my colleague Nazim Haq, who's just joined our staff but it, and, and uh, is just getting her feet into a, a, a very major project we're doing in one neighborhood in Toronto, the St. Jamestown neighborhood, looking at uh, uh, newcomers and immigrant health. Uh, we've done some work with some community organizations there and it's been our observation that when people come to uh, Canada, uh, they, their health status is usually better than most Canadians and that's partly a function of the immigration system. We don't let sick people into Canada as a rule. Um, but after they've been here for a while, they're sicker than uh, people who are resident Canadians, and uh, that uh, is uh, an obvious concern. We know that poverty is a factor. We know that their uh, social exclusion and uh, uh, lack of housing are factors, uh, and there are other uh, other issues. So, part of the work Nazim will be doing over the next five years is coordinating a very detailed project in one very specific neighborhood that'll get right into those uh, issues. But we do think that the general question of, of, um, uh, of affordable housing uh, as it relates to, um, uh, to a city like Toronto which opens our arms, uh, or at least uh, in theory we open our arms to people from around the world and say welcome, come to Toronto, we want you to be here. But then uh, when people come they find uh, uh, that they're often uh, uh, segregated in neighborhoods with poor housing, little services, uh, jobs that are at the low end of the, uh, the wage scale. Uh, and uh, other issues along that line. And that has a, an, an impact on their personal health and it has an impact on uh, the entire community as well. The information and data. It's been challenging trying to get up to the information about the prevalence of uh, homelessness in the city as it relates to a specific set of populations. And I'm interested in particular with uh, youth and uh, women uh, who have children, young children. And um, I haven't seen your detailed report, and I wondered whether your document gets to that level of detail in terms of uh, who are in shelters and. We, we do report some numbers. We don't actually do any, we haven't commissioned any of our own research on that issue. Uh, homeless people and, and uh, various subsections of the homeless population are, are referred to by uh, the people who count things as a hard to count population, uh, which is another cruel label that they have to bear. But uh, there's a lot of reasons why it's hard to count homeless people. Uh, uh, it's a survival tactic for many homeless people to be as invisible as possible, to look as 
non-homeless as you can. Uh, and there are many other reasons as well why homelessness uh, is such a difficult uh, issue. We've been a bit concerned uh, about, uh, uh, we don't know that there's any way to, to come up with scientific precision. There are a few um, researchers now who are looking at different statistical methods of counting uh, homeless uh, people. Uh, uh, there's a, a new social science, or not a new method, but a method being incorporated into social science from uh, physical science called capture-recapture method, which some people think might be a more helpful method in terms of coming up with more precise numbers about both the overall homeless population and some of the subsets that you've mentioned, youth and so on. That hasn't been done here in Toronto, and I only know of one or two uh, social scientists in the United States that want to try and use some new statistical methods. Just in general, this is an ongoing conversation that goes beyond 10 years. Um, we should be looking at the long-term economy, um, we're starting to run out of resources globally, and we're still every six to eight years doubling the amount of resources and money going into high-tech industries. So at some point, if we're going to be able to continue um, to fund housing and other social programs at this rate, we're going to be looking at a need to uh, conserve resources by reducing our spending in uh, high-tech primarily, which is the one area that's really coming out of control. But we do have to have a long-term plan to preserve the resources of the world and pre prevent them from being consumed in, in high-tech adventures. Uh, I'll just quickly say thanks, Michael. I uh, absolutely agree that this has to be netted in, and, and one of the things that's very important is that uh, there is an emerging recognition, uh, j j and to bring it down a couple levels, you were at the big sort of macroeconomic level, to bring it down more to actually building this. We also recognize that one of the uh, issues in the old social housing program of the 70s and 80s was that there wasn't a lot of flexibility in terms of building to uh, a, a healthy, sustainable, and especially environmentally sustainable standard, and so many uh, social housing residents now are living in housing uh, that is uh, very expensive uh, and environmentally uh, uh, inefficient uh, uh, to heat and, uh, and so on. So, um, you know, again, I'll, I noticed Bob Fougere is here, who's the interim executive director of the Toronto Environmental Alliance, and uh, the partnership that's emerged in recent years between uh, environmental activists and housing activists has been very important. And I think that, uh, in terms of looking ahead, we've had some very specific discussions uh, uh, with the uh, people in uh, the provincial and federal governments as they're setting overall policy for uh, uh, housing initiatives to make sure that uh, sustainability is one of the factors that's taken in. I'm looking at 4,500 new homes in one year. Uh, currently, there's about 150,000 people waiting on the waiting list. Now, I've also noticed that you have rent supplements of 9,750. Currently, a lot of my clients are on some sort of social assistance for DSP that gives $427 uh, for rent. Um, a lot of my clients have the majority of my clients have compromised health, which is not effective for $427 for rent, because you're basically going to get a room. Uh, now, the question is, is that concerning those clients, is there anywhere in this plan that deals with looking at a shorter time solution, because 4500 is a dent in the bucket in reality, and I hope no one makes sense to that. Uh, but is there a shorter term solution of saying we need people to get housed mm -hmm. now? Is there a way of looking at the private market and trying to get more and more rent subsidies or increasing the, uh, the shelter allowed for people on social and, and The sh short answer is yes. Um, and then there's a couple of ways that, that, um, uh, that there are about 9,000 vacant uh, private rental apartment units in Toronto, some of which are, of course, way up in the stratospheric end of the rent scale and would not be appropriate for rent supplements because it just as it is, would not be a, a prudent use of uh, public funds. Uh, but uh, a significant number of those units are available, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, as our first step was to talk about an immediate strategy uh, of uh, uh, targeting half of the um, population of people in homeless shelters and getting them into private housing through uh, rent supplements. We also propose on top of that uh, an additional um, uh, allocation of rent uh, supplements. I think your basic point uh, is a powerful point, though, that uh, um, 
even if this entire plan were adopted uh, tomorrow, uh, there it, it would take some time to deal with what has been a huge uh, and growing uh, disaster in terms of homelessness uh, and affordable housing. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not sure that I'm not sure, to be honest, that the uh, the housing sector has the capacity to build much more than this. This, this target is about double what the sector was building in Toronto. Uh, back in the early 1990s and late 1980s, at the peak of the federal and provincial programs, so this probably is, you know, it's, uh, it is very optimistic, especially with the current diminished capacity of the sector. Um, in the meantime, there are some initiatives which um, may or may not provide much comfort. Uh, yesterday, a group of us met with uh, senior city housing officials around an uh, initiative that was passed to have 100 rent supplement units uh, designated for people who have a, uh, immunocompromised uh, health conditions. 100 is <laughs> pretty appalling, uh, set against the overall need in the city, but 100 is better than nothing, I guess. Uh, and it's, it, it, the, the hope is it's a foot in the door, and, and, and once these 100 get rolled out, then we can go back and say, fine, uh, let's now start ramping up that particular initiative as well. The city does have, incidentally, we do mention that the city does have the uh, authority under its um, under the Social Housing Reform Act to designate priority groups in terms of the waiting lists. Uh, they're able to house about 4,400 people a year through the waiting list because of natural rollover in the list. Uh, at the moment, they don't use that uh, power very creatively, um, and that's part of the reason for this meeting yesterday to to come up with uh, some definitions of what uh, constitute an immune compromised uh, health conditions. Um, and it was a very bureaucratic meeting in some ways because we were discussing very precise health conditions, none of which I had any idea what they were talking about. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> More broadly than that, thanks for this framework and ending homelessness is only going to happen when we're all working together. So thanks to everybody for all the work you've been doing over the years. I encourage you to log on to the Wellesley website and you'll see um, uh, some action tips uh, that are posted there. And Michael's around if you want to come up and talk to him. Like there was a lot of people here and uh, it's positive, I hope something comes out of it. It's just, uh, it's like it's That's my whole thing. Um, Michael knows the stuff, you know, he, he did a lot of research and put together a really thorough document, so there's a lot of the action involved, um, and I think it'll be really promising and really positive. Someone brought up a point uh, during the uh, conference that, you know, there's been a ton of plans written, a ton of reports written, but it seems that they never really come to fruition. Does it seem like this could be any different to you guys? Uh, hopefully, because it's a really strong group right now. Uh, I don't know as much about the industry, but the, the strong sort of community that's behind it um, hopefully will really put you know, their action to task. And, uh, I think, you know, a lot of perseverance, you know, oh, okay. Okay. Or, or we're gonna a lot of constant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we. Don't worry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, it could be a bad as opposed to a good in a sense where this document is more so well done that it should be the if it's overshadowed by anything else, then yeah, that could be a sticking point. But uh, I think this community is really together, they all have the same cause and they all want to do the same thing. So, um, and, you know, for the most part, I think the action will be taken. Okay. Uh, can I get your names, if you don't mind, and if you have any sort of affiliations? Uh, Paul Mattel from Defining Design. Uh, the second stage is going to have to be for TCHC to clean up their properties around the city so it's fit for the people to live in. And we have to solve the homelessness problem in this next four years. We can't wait anymore. It has to be solved now. And whoever you vote for or whatever you do, just get involved and, and bring homelessness to the number one issue at these all candidate debates. Just keep asking the politicians about it and they'll have to listen. And what's going to keep uh, this report from falling by the wayside like so many ones previously had? Well, I hate to say it, Canadians are great on reports, but action is another story. And I think we have to take immediate action on homelessness in Toronto or we're going to be a complete disgrace around the world. We already are. Our, our TCHC and our other housing projects are slumps. That's all they are. And they warehouse poor people with all kinds of health and issue problems, you know, like I said before, like mental health and addiction. And they just recycle them out when they've had enough. We need good supportive housing, co-op housing, supportive housing, um, even um, home ownership for poor people. That's what we need. And we need to stop the gentrification that's going on in our communities, like Regent is being gentrified. And then, God knows, Moss Park or Jamestown will be next to go. And just wake up to the homelessness problem in this city. You want to be world class, deal with this now. Can I just get your name again? Sorry, I don't think it's Connie Harrison, I'm in Ward 28 in Toronto. Here at the Members Lounge at, uh, in the Clamshell, and uh, we have a citizen who has uh, been listening to the report by Michael Shopkoff from Wellesley Institute, and she has something uh, to share with us. And your name is? Julie Beddows. And uh, how did it go today? Um, well, I'm thrilled with Michael's uh, program. I I, he's not a frivolous person, and if he says it can be done, I believe that it can be done. I just wish it was more and faster. 4,500 a year doesn't sound a lot, given the nature of the problem. 4,500 units, he was units. talking about. That doesn't seem enough, but, you know, it's better than we've got now. But my... The thing that's really bugging me these days is that, although we've been promised reforms of the OMB so that um, developers... Uh, wouldn't be able to appeal decisions by elected bodies. Mm. Those reforms haven't been enacted. It hasn't happened. And on the waterfront site, um, through a lot of community work, but also through a very supportive public agency, the Waterfront Corporation, um, we have got high standards of environmental sustainability and quantities of affordable housing into the bylaws for those sites, where the sites are currently in public ownership where the sites are currently public owned, the Waterfront Corporation can act as landowner and impose the development contracts they choose to impose. Where the sites are owned by private landlords, um, they just refuse to meet those standards. And if the city had passed a zoning bylaw requiring them to, they would have gone straight to the OMB and it would have been thrown out. And I, that causes me much grief and consternation. I don't see why private developers who are having money poured into their lap through public initiatives like rezoning, like building a very comprehensive, attractive infrastructure on the waterfront, seeing the value of their sites multiply, 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 um, will can then not be expected to give full benefit back to the community. I think um, the province has let us down on that, um, and they should be called to account. Well, uh, we have an election coming up provincially uh, next year. Uh, we would have the opportunity to call them to account then. We have an election in a few days uh, municipally, and uh, these councillors and the candidates for council, including myself, are uh, much closer to these issues that you've just spoken of uh, in the last few moments. Uh, what message do you have, or what would you hope uh, to happen in the few days leading up to the election and then on election day? Well, first of all, everyone should elect councillors who will um, support every possible initiative 
to solve the housing, house, housing problem, but there are limits to what the city can do. The city could have passed a zoning by, by law for the waterfront that would have said private landlords have to build a certain standard. It wouldn't have got them anyway. It might have got us no affordable housing at all if it was thrown out by the OMB. So we have to settle for the little bit of crumbs that they're willing. And um, the pro provincial election, I mean the problem in Toronto is the Liberals can't lose seats, the Tories can't win them. So neither of them has any interest in doing anything for Toronto. If we had marginal seats, believe me, things would be very different. But we're, we're a write-off for the Tories and the Liberals know we'll go. We don't think they may, but um, other people will go on voting for them no matter what they do. This almost sounds like uh, Harold Ballard's uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. He, they kept losing and yeah. we kept buying the gold exactly. seat tickets. I mean, it's a real catch-22. But um, I don't know what kind of disaster it will take to get people to recognize how serious this is. I mean, a big epidemic, who knows? God forbid. Uh, God forbid. But uh, I would like to leave it on a hopeful note. Any little bit of uh, perhaps a crumb of hope uh, in the housing situation uh, that you heard today that uh, left you with a, a uh, uh, glimmer of uh, inspiration? Anything? Well, I don't know. I these meetings are always preaching to the concern, to the uh, choir, you know, everyone in the room is all fired up and anxious, but outside this room, where it'll fall off a cliff, and um, I'm really sorry about that. You know, when Michael quotes the Bank of Nova Scotia and the Board of Trade and how supportive they are for, the, uh, for affordable housing, why don't they talk to their clients? who will go straight to the OMB the second they're asked to build it. I mean, I, I think if we're relying on the banking industry to solve the problem, we're in real trouble. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Uh, thank okay. you very much for your thoughts. Your name is? Julie. Julie, and do you know what ward uh, that you're in? 28. In? We have a great councillor. Vote for Pam. Vote for Pam McConnell? <laughs> Absolutely. There we go. She's the best. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Good luck. I hope you, you get 2,000 votes. <laughs> at, at least. At least. Yeah. At least. Thank you. If not more. Whereabouts is Fort 19? Uh, it's uh, Bathurst, Koreatown, Christie, DuPont, the Tracks, Dovercourt, and the CNE. So Dovercourt is, is how north, far north? Uh, right to the railroad tracks. Oh, okay. Yeah, because okay. I'd say my son is north of there because I want um, Bravo to get in.